You ever find yourself in an awkward social situation? What if you don't have the mental tools to navigate that? How can role-playing games help? Welcome to Gaining Advantage. Welcome to Gaining Advantage. Wormworks Publishing is all about using role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons to make other people's lives better. If you haven't yet, this is a great opportunity to grab some of our free resources right now. You can go to the DMs Guild or to our website, wormworkspublishing.com, and get our Accessible Adventure of the Week, our Disabled NPC of the Week, or you can go to our website and sign up for our newsletter to get notifications of all the new resources that we're creating. In fact, speaking of that, we have a special adventure coming out on Monday, September 27th, called The Price of Success. It's a Halloween horror adventure that teaches about child abuse, its warning signs, and related issues. And it was edited and consulted by Naomi Hazlitt, who is the occupational therapist that you're going to meet in today's interview. She was a huge help to enable producing a truly unique and beneficial adventure. But take into consideration the subject matter, which may be too difficult for your players but it has a section to help you discuss it with your players. So it's free on the DMs Guild. You can go check it out. Sign up for our newsletter to get that link when it launches, because if you're watching or listening to this uh, before Monday, it will not be available yet. And so that said, let's get right to our interview. Challenging and unforgiving for people on the autism spectrum as they try to navigate the complex social rules that each culture requires. What if there were a way to help them adapt and develop these skills in a safe and comfortable environment with dice? Today, we're happy to have Daniel Kwan and Naomi Hazlitt of Level Up Gaming, where they're actually doing that. Welcome, Naomi and Daniel. Hey. Thanks. Thanks for having us. All right, so what would each of you like us to know about you personally, specifically speaking to the tabletop role-playing game crowd? Naomi, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, so I started, I, I, don't, I feel like I'm a bit of a latecomer, but it's all relative. I mean, I started um, with video games that were based on role-playing mechanics when I was a kid, and um fell in love with them, found that, you know, some of the things that I'm seeing now as a, you know, facilitator of tabletop games uh, resonated with me in the same way, even when I was young. And I'm sure we'll get into all of those things, but, you know, just kind of having the freedom to take on different identities and trying things in a safe space and, you know, learning about myself along the way. And then, you know, later on, I started to find gaming communities myself, um, and along, I guess along the way, I was working on my career at the same time and became an occupational therapist. Um, met Daniel, uh, met Christian Blake. I believe both of them are the co-founders of Level Up Gaming. And uh, I was signed on uh, pretty recently, I think about a year ago. And uh, again, now I get the chance to put together uh, the things that I experienced for myself with uh, some of the skills that I've learned along the way in terms of being an occupational therapist. Um, I still can't believe that I get to do this. This is an, it's an incredible um, organization and it's an incredible thing that we do. And I'm just very grateful that we got the chance to talk about it with you today. Yeah, Thank you. I guess. Uh, who am I? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm Daniel Kwan. I'm, uh, well, I guess I'm, I'm a former educator and archaeologist. Uh, I work in you know the tech world now, um, and I moonlight as a you know tabletop RPG podcaster uh, and game designer. Um, I'm one of the co-hosts and the showrunner of the uh, any award-winning Asians Represent podcast, and um, uh, publishing. I guess I've done a lot in the tabletop world. Uh, most recently, I published uh, Candlekeep Mysteries with Wizards of the Coast. Um, I authored one of the adventures there, the Book of Inner Alchemy. Um, I've worked for other companies like, uh, you know, uh, Dimension 20, um, Paizo, Darker Hue Studios, and uh, a couple others. Uh, right now, I'm publicly working on, I guess, what is public. I'm one of the mechanical designers for Into the Motherlands, which is a science fiction RPG that's supposed to be published next year. 
right. And I guess I do level up gaming. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads us to the next question. Tell us about your work. How does level up gaming work? Danny, why don't you take this? It, it has it has evolved, like not only in the past year, but since we started. So uh, level up was founded by uh, you know myself, Christian Blake, and and Kelsey McIver, who's who's a spec ed teacher. Uh, in 2016, uh, we called ourselves Roleplay TO, and then we found out that another organization or another group had that name, so we switched it up to Level Up Gaming. Uh, initially, we, um, we we started running everything in person, uh, and we still work with an occupational therapy collective called Dreamweavers, and they kind of help run the administrative side of Level Up. Um, we started doing, you know, in-person games playing a variety of you know ttrpgs and not just dnd we've done things like uh, coriolis pugmire urban shadows um and like even some like smaller ones like wildlings and things like that um and we would always have uh one person who's a gm and another person who was an occupational therapist and the occupational therapist was often there to do things like make observations and help other folks out with goals and and you know and group norms um and then obviously the pandemic hit and things kind of changed uh we had to adapt and what ended up you know coalescing out of this strange situation that the world has found itself in is this new virtual model that naomi has been a part of uh, naomi you actually came, naomi actually came to visit our group on I think like the the final session of our last ever in person group. Uh, I'm not saying that there's a curse. Um, <laughs> no, but Naomi joined us. I, at I don't last. think we can blame her for COVID. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Um, but Naomi came on the last day, and immediately I was like, "Oh, this person's super cool." Um, and you know, when the pandemic hit, everybody's you know availability changed, and Naomi and I started running it, and we made a. We, we decided to kind of really commit to one change that we had um, been starting to make in our in-person groups. And it was having the occupational therapist not only play the role of, you know, um, like a, almost like a behavioral moderator um, or, like an, or like a passive sort of observer, but also an active role in the story as a character uh, to model sort of like group norms and the kind of behavior that we were all working on. Um, and so Naomi not only serves as a as like one of the protagonists in all of our stories, but then takes on that role of the occupational therapist. Whereas I take on the role of the GM, and you know adapting the story to you know the specific needs of the players. Uh, we do everything now through um, basically a, a couple of different tools. We use Zoom for our our video and our chat. Um, because it allows us, you know, create a password and have a waiting room, but also private chats. Uh, that way, Naomi and I can kind of converse in private on the same platform, or Naomi or myself can message a participant uh, in private to either, you know, check in on them or offer a suggestion if we if we find that they they might be stuck. Um, we use D and D Beyond uh, to manage character sheets. Uh, since D and D Beyond is super accessible, it not only lets us build characters like we would have in person, um, but it also allows us to, um, you know, have visibility of everyone else's character sheets. It's got the built-in dice roller, tells you what the spells and all the attacks and abilities do, so it creates a lower barrier of entry to folks who have never played before. Uh, and then for our virtual tabletop, we use something called Owl Bear Rodeo, uh, since it's got a very minimalistic user interface. Um, so it's not so distracting, and it's very free-form and egalitarian. Naomi, did I miss anything? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to kind of trace the history and the evolution of the program and now how I came in and we, as soon as we were transitioning to the virtual platform, and it was just interesting to see how, I mean, we had to shift our norms a little bit on the one hand, but it also created opportunities, like you said, to make the game more accessible and um, help support the players as best we can. So, yeah, it's been a very interesting journey so far. Yeah, I honestly think you joining Level Up was like a breath of fresh air because, like, you came in as someone with a lot of D&D &D experience. So you can you know the nuances of the game, and it's really, it's really great having that. Um, and then... 
you know, doing the virtual tool is so great because you're also a gamer, like you said. So that that sort of digital etiquette is really something that you're familiar with. And you have that sort of digital literacy that allows you to basically focus on the people without having to worry about the digital tools. Mm -hmm. Did you ever and we've got ideas for the next program too. <laughs> Do you ever imagine that that would, you know, be something you'd put on a resume? <laughs> I, I, Naomi, I, I definitely didn't. I definitely not either. I mean, there's always ways of sneakily putting it in, right? Like group facilitation skills or ability. Oh, I straight up put what I do on my resume. Like it's it's there <laughs> on my resume. It's it's on my resume. It's on my LinkedIn. <laughs> I don't hide that. <laughs> no, I mean, and I don't hide it. It's not like I'm hiding it anymore maybe i feel like level up was like well i mean this is obviously a legitimate thing that you can do as a professional um it's hard sometimes to explain it to some people but honestly don't care anymore and i mean this is proof that people are interested in learning what it is and i'm seeing i'm sure there's just been like tabletop games are just getting more and more and more mainstream and i think the next step is for people to really rec rec recognize that they're not just a not to say they're just a leisure activity but leisure isn't just about having fun it's so much more than that so all it is to say is yeah it's on my resume too <laughs> and um yeah i'm happy i'm happy it's there all right so how do people on the autism spectrum benefit from your work this is a you thing naomi Oh, if you say so. I think it's a team <laughs> effort, but um, I mean, the best person to to talk about this, I think, is are the players. But since the players aren't here, I'll try my best to uh, reflect some of the feedback or comments or experiences that I've, I've witnessed in the game. Um, autistic people sometimes, um, well, have a little bit of trouble with unstructured social situations, or I guess another way of putting that is, uh, you know, uh, neurotypical people um, may not gravitate to towards more structured uh, social interactions. But all that is to say is, I think that generally speaking, role playing games have such a cool blend of freedom and structure. So, you know, with D&D, &D, you're going, you walk into an inn, and, you know, when I walk into an inn in real life, it's like I could do three thousands of different things. And that's kind of overwhelming. Right. And so if I walk into an inn in D&D, &D, I have a limited amount of skills. Right. I have a list of skills that I can do. I can persuade somebody. I can intimidate somebody. And that may, like I just said, it may seem limiting, but it absolutely not. I tell, you know, I tell people when we're, you know, at level up when I'm uh, GMing myself, if you don't know what to do, just tell me what you want to do. And then I'll tell you what skill might best match that. So if you want, I think when you're kind of starting in situations in D&D, you can really follow along with the rules. And then as you get the hang of the rules, you can kind of get to a point where you're feeling more comfortable experimenting with what you want to do and testing the rules. And all of this takes place in a in a situation where it's a step away from you, you know? So if your character makes a social um, error, does something that makes other people uncomfortable, you get the feedback, but you don't, it doesn't, you know, if we're doing it right, affect you uh, reflect on your own character as a person. And so what that does is give you the space to try a different, a bunch of different things. You have your, your social sandbox, and then what people have, I've heard from people, I've heard from participants, and I do research as well into TRPGs. And so what I've heard from uh, research participants and just informally is um, it gives people the confidence to try different things now in, in the real world. So in a nutshell, I mean, that's, I think, the one of the best things that we can offer at Level Up. But, you know, there's also other skills that just kind of happen organically within the world, just like they happen in our world. So, um, you know, I think we've done a, a lot of work around time, well, other than social skills, right? Like collaboration and communication, like we've been focusing a lot on time management, right? So, you know, we can do everything, you can do anything you want, but you only have a day and here's the situation that's unfolding. And so we have to make 
choices, difficult choices about what we want to do. Um, so they can kind of integrate or money management, you know, okay, you want to buy that, but do you have the money? And so it's really the possibilities are kind of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of possibilities. So I think or, or that's if you like, Or if you like don't have the money, well, somebody could definitely share or lend, uh, right? Yeah. That happened in our last session um, when somebody wanted to buy, uh, was it like a guinea pig? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and my character lent lent him all my money. Um, and and that, that came back multiple <laughs> times. That came back multiple times throughout the story that your character helped them out. Um, I mean, like another thing we, we've definitely seen, especially in the past year, is is sort of um, experimenting with, with gender identity. Um, that's, that's one that we've definitely seen in respecting people's pronouns and kind of normalizing that um, is one thing that is very... Um, that remote sort of D&D has been really good at helping us do, especially with, you know, the virtual tabletop has your name, uh, your character's pronouns and your pronouns. Um, so that's been really great. Or, or you know, people uh, correcting others about their pronouns in a way that isn't like, you know, doing that and, and practicing how to talk about that with other people in a really low risk environment. Like Naomi mentioned stakes or something that, you know, you could certainly talk about like, what's at stake here? How much time do we have? But at the same time, D&D gives you effectively an infinite amount of time to make these decisions. Um, and it also kind of gives you this sense of safety because failure is always interesting in D&D. Um, because you're, you're able to, you know, make a mistake and learn from it and adapt to it. But also a mistake is never the end of whatever you're trying to do. It's always a, you know, a, a minor obstacle and it, it kind of helps folks develop that resilience when it comes to actually going and trying something new, um, and doing something that they might not feel confident to do in real life and play around with it and try it in D and D to the point where maybe they'll try that in real life. Maybe they'll try say, you know, asking for something that they've never asked for before, or maybe they'll try, you know, calling up a friend and asking them how they're doing, or, you know, maybe they'll go and offer to help somebody do something. Right. Um, I think it certainly helps with confidence as well uh, in that sense. To add on to that, I think just a quick note about failure. I feel like sometimes when the stakes are higher, you feel a lot of social anxiety or, you know, you're feeling not very confident. Uh, a social, you know, failure might seem like the end of the world. And what D&D what &D does is show you the story is not done. The story keeps going and you keep finding different, you know, you're going to keep rolling and find different ways to continue to solve your problem or to make, you know, different choices. And I think, you know, I, I think it's interesting to show care, you know, people that they can, like you said, be resilient and recover from failure. And that I think instills that confidence and that curiosity to continue to, to explore. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So how can people outside of the Toronto area benefit from your work? I mean, now that we're remote. It, it's yeah. I think it's just a time zone thing. I mean, right now, I think we're we're currently only serving Canadians. Um, but given that we're remote, we can we have the ability to now serve people outside of the GTA. Um, right now, we have the the difficult problem of having a lot of demand and just the two of us. Um, so, uh, you know, in the future, Naomi and I are looking to expand, you know, have a, another GM, have another OT. Um, but you know, maintain a sense of you know this this connectedness in between the groups. Naomi and I have been talking a lot, and we have a lot of big ideas about how we want to have multiple groups going and separate adventures, but with an interwoven plot that can eventually connect and stuff like that. Um, so so we we have big plans, and you know, being remote allows us to not only do these really grand things and have these breakout rooms in Zoom or all these different virtual tabletops, but also again serve people outside of Toronto where we couldn't before. Yeah, no, I, I've heard that a lot. Um, where where COVID is, has pushed, uh, well, on the one hand, it's 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 never as good as being in person and being able to sit around a table. Um, it really has expanded uh, reach. Uh, so definitely, um, yeah. 
So how have you seen lives change because of your work? Daniel? <laughs> like like in like er every way we talked about previously. I, I mean, in our last session, we had we had folks who were like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to college. Like I go to college like in September or like and I'm going to play D&D &D with with a club at the college. so I won't be able to go to level up like that's wild in like all the best ways or like, oh, I just got a job. That was a big one. Remember, Naomi it was like, yeah. hey, I got a job interview. And then like a week later, it was like, I got the job. Uh, and like, that's super cool. That's like really awesome to see. Um, or, you know, we, we see folks, uh, you know, feel comfortable about about their themselves and their their pronouns to say like hey these are my pronouns um mm -hmm. um i would say those are like the the big ones like people feel comfortable talking about like relationships or um even mentoring new people that's something we saw in, in our latest program as well our latest program was just like a really big <laughs> deal for both of us <laughs> mm -hmm. it was both a challenge, but then a huge feeling of success. That's the one example, I think the most recent one that really came to mind where I, you know, Daniel, you've been working with some of the participants for longer than me. Five years. But, but yeah. And I mean, so I've been in the group and seeing the same people for about a year, but I'm still, I'm starting to feel, you know, more comfortable and they're probably starting to feel more comfortable with me. And I'm starting to get to know people. And then we had a younger participant come in and to see, I saw things that I'd never seen from the participants before, mainly that, you know, we were wondering, you know, this, this younger person was, you know, bringing a different energy into the group was, you know, maybe sharing memes, no one had shared memes before, or maybe just getting a sense of maybe just getting to know how D and D works in the, in the kind of group culture that we had established. But, everyone just took this participant under their wing and it was just wonderful to see a mentorship piece of all. So not only people aren't in this, not only for themselves, but now they're in it to support other people. And it just made me feel very, uh, it was very gratifying. I felt very grateful. And that was like a very, I think that's one of the biggest reasons we were so happy about how this most recent session went. Yeah, I would say it not help help people not only in game but in real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, yeah, definitely. Yeah, this session was 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 huge for for us. Just we saw this like e explosion of progress. They leveled up. You could say. yeah, they literally, <laughs> literally leveled up. <laughs> All right, you just rescued a gin from the hands of an Ifrit. And it offers you three wishes to achieve Level Up Gaming's goals. What do you wish for? I thought about this one. <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about this too. Um, I mean, I, I mean, oh, go ahead, Naomi. Oh yeah, I mean, the three that I, the biggest things when really thinking about it is, I think the number one challenge is um, we work with people who are have challenges around being a socially isolated, right? And so I always wonder, how do we, you know, are we, do people know about us? Do we know where to look? And so if I could just wish, you know, I wish that anyone who was interested in playing D&D &D and who, you know, struggles with sort of the things that we work on would be able to know about us was kind of the one thing that I wanted to, was the number one thing. Um, and I think the second one is it's on its way. I mean, I think that having accessible tools that are mainstream would be great. I mean, we we make the game accessible and Daniel makes uh, the game accessible in a lot of different ways. Um, but, you know, just, I, th and I think, you know, like we also, I don't know if we talked about Owl Bear Rodeo is a very yeah. accessible, um, what's the word for like a tabletop emulator? It's a VTT, a virtual tabletop. Yeah, it's a great uh, VTT. Uh, I we really what we really like is that you can um, people can zoom or you know zoom in and out on their own. Unlike Zoom, you know you kind of have to go along with whatever the person's screen sharing. They can move their own tokens. There's audio, but you can mute it or turn it up and down. There is a dice roller, so if you don't, you know, we have a participant who doesn't like to switch between too many tabs. So the dice rolling can happen in the engine. But on the other hand, sometimes, for example, character sheets are a little overwhelming or sometimes the, our abilities are hidden kind of near the bottom. And so 
I just wish I could find, you know, I, Oe Freak, please, or, or Jin, please give us <laughs> uh, more and more tools in the future to make the game even more accessible. Um, and then I guess my third wish is one day for us to be able to have an option to play in person again. So hopefully they've they've heard me. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, my, my first one would also be in person. I would, honestly, I would, if I had one wish, it would be if we had a dedicated space. Um, when we were doing it in person, I used to carry, I used to bike around the city with four player's handbooks, a dungeon master's guide, a monster manual, a laptop, I don't know, uh, 60, 70 dice, miniatures, food, all, all of it for myself on this, in this big backpack and I used to bike around the city. Um, and like, I got really strong from it, but also I'm pretty sure I have some long-term stuff going on here. Um, so I would love to have like, you know, like a dedicated space where we could have huge terrain setups. Um, but what I think is really neat about doing in person is that in remotely, I've learned about tools that can make in-person gaming accessible to folks who aren't even there. Uh, there's a really cool tool that is not yet valuable to us at Level Up called Vorpal Board. And it actually allows you to set up remote cameras through like your phone or something that a participant can actually remotely enter with a dice roller and a webcam. And they can actually click from their screen, like on Google Hangouts or, or Zoom or something. Um, it, it'll look like it was through their own proprietary platform. And they can actually click on the terrain and the GM can actually see where they're pointing and can move the mini remotely. Um, or they can, a player who's remote can identify where they want to go on a physical setup. So this would allow us to not only have folks who want the in-person experience there, but also engage folks who are not there in a meaningful way that doesn't feel like they are a secondary participant. Um, so I would love to do in-person, but I would love to leverage other tools like Dwarven Forge, send me all of the stuff. I would love it. Um, but it's also heavy, so I, uh, I would, I would, I would love a space. Uh, number two for me would be uh, expansion. Um, I would love to give um, GMs an opportunity to use their skills to impact, you know, their local communities, and I would love for OTs to do atypical work um, because that's how you know different industries, you know, evolve, right? They, we, they, they use case studies, you know, to prove that this kind of work is meaningful and, and matters. So I would love to have expansion um, in that I think it provides opportunities for those who are running it and those who are participating. Um, I think it creates, you know, great connections in local communities. So I would love to see other folks running it um, in a way where we could ensure that, you know, the exact same quality that we provide is being provided um, to other people, whether it be through like written adventures or, or meetings or big, huge Zoom calls, who knows? Um, but I would love to do something like that. And then my, my third one would be, and I, um, I, I was in talks with the big company about this before the pandemic, um, but I would love to provide opportunities to level up gaming participants to go to a convention. Um, because, you know, conventions are overwhelming spaces. Um, and I would love to collaborate with a convention and we were doing this, but then, you know, the pandemic kind of happened. I would love to collaborate with the convention to create a more accessible space where folks who are on the spectrum can come and not feel overwhelmed by the crowds and the noise of a convention and still participate and be there. Um, I would love if, you know, over time, we could actually create a fund to bring people to gaming conventions to do that sort of stuff as kind of an extension of what we do. Because I feel like that that is the, a natural next step in learning the game, learning how to interact with others, and then interacting with the wider gaming community and seeing that kind of acceptance. We, we have a, a local convention here in Toronto that was the perfect candidate for it called Breakout Con. Um, it's smaller. It's, um, they have an emphasis on you know, inclusion and accessibility. Um, so that, that is a, a future goal of, of mine. There you go, Naomi. Now, you know, one of my goals. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> wow. That's great. If you, uh, you, you develop that stuff, uh, you know, kind of how that would work and, and stuff and what would need to be done. Um, 
that would be worth you talk about letting people know what resources are available yeah then making those resources available to other conventions or to i mean you know i'd be happy to talk to my local uh convention uh operators here in the twin cities and in the sort of yeah. midwest and, and stuff to try to make that happen that would be amazing yeah i i i sit on the advisory board for um a nonprofit here in toronto called um path of play uh, it's another one for um the autism community. Uh, my my pal uh, Mike Promo runs it. His his son is on the spectrum, and what he does is he provides uh, gaming opportunities uh, for schools and folks on the spectrum. Before COVID, he actually has his house. He would actually invite families over so they could socialize and play um, uh, pinball, uh, because he he found that through his son, it's a great way um, for folks to stim, and uh, so they do all sorts of events and. Um, I was going to collaborate with with Mike on a tabletop one, but obviously the pandemic changed things. So we, I do have a prospective partner to kind of develop this with and kind of leverage their resources and their community, you know, with our resources and our experience. Um, so it's definitely something that can happen. And I'd love to, you know, with, with Naomi test it out in Toronto and then see if we could provide a, a case study or a framework for other conventions. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. All right, so what one message would you like to give gamers who are on the autism spectrum? Games are for you. Like, you, if, if you want to play it, go and play it. Um, like, tabletop games are meant to be for everyone, and they're, they're designed in that way. Um, one thing that can be scary for people is that there are all of these rules. But the thing is, like, if you're looking at Dungeons & Dragons, it's not truly a game. Dungeons and Dragons is, a, is like a toolbox for you to tell a story. And you can use whatever tools you want out of that toolbox to tell the story that you want, right? It's also only one kind of toolbox. So if you find one that's of a theme that you'd like, pick up that toolbox and, and see what things in there you like. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're a parent, same thing, right? Give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's well said. I think what i yeah I, I totally agree with you daniel in terms of like the game is for you just like it's for anybody else um and you can make it what you want it to be you know i think i've had experiences where um people have maybe said you know this is how the game is supposed to be played or this is you know how it what makes it fun and really there is no uh, one way to play. There's no one way that makes it fun. And there is a group out there for you is, you know, there are, you know, tables that are, you know, the best tables are inclusive and welcoming and respect different approaches to gameplay. You know, I think we had a conversation in group actually between myself and another participant where I was, you know, saying for me, I really enjoy the narrative part. And you know, mechanics are important to me, but they're not as important as telling a story. And then I think another player in the game, you know, acknowledged that and said, yeah, you know, like, uh, it seems like you really like the story and rather than, you know, the mechanics oh, and this, you know, this participant, I think might ha have been a little more interested in the mechanics of the game or combat. And so just to acknowledge that and, and make sure we're making space for everybody to highlight what everybody likes about it, include that. Um, and that's possible. So, you know, don't be discouraged if that's not something you find right away. Uh, and maybe in the future, you can always GM and then, you know, you can bring that community uh, together yourself as well, which is really exciting. And just never be ashamed of what you like. Um, some, you know, I know that that maybe it, it's, I don't feel like even in 2021, I think that's worth saying, although TRPGs are becoming more mainstream, I think they're still they're pretty sometimes mainstream. a bit of a, yeah. There can be a bit of a not a you know, stigma. I mean, people just you know, people ask me all the time, like, "What are you doing? Like, what are you playing?" So I don't really get the, oh, that's not you know a real. Actually, I did recently get that. I had a oh. I had somebody. Yeah, I had um, someone who was going in applying for the occupational therapy program reach out to me and ask for opportunities to volunteer or shadow my work. And I talked about D and D. And they said, well, that's not really real occupational therapy. So I don't think I'm interested in that. And I, that's fine if they're not interested. But clearly the other part, I was kind of like storming around my it's apartment. Real. That, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, no, it's totally real. And so again, the message to players is it's 
yeah, don't ever be, you don't ever have to justify or explain or defend your hobby. D and D is awesome. And, uh, don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. I mean, if, if even for the occupational therapy side, it's like to say that, you know, a tool that, you know, to say that one thing isn't real occupational therapy is to basically say, well, I don't see the potential in here. Like mm -hmm. what if you get a client who's tabletop RPGs are their thing? Are you going to say that that's not valid or the way in which they express themselves isn't valid? No. I mean, it's a different toolkit, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's all great. Like different things work for different people. Traditional, I don't even know what traditional OT is. Um, you're asking the wrong person, but from, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's the, the rehabilitation, the physical, you know, the idea of, you know, engaging in everyday activity. And yeah, so, but, but yeah, I mean, TRPGs, I think that I'm very interested rather than having somebody in a clinic, you know, doing things that are not, you know, necessarily as well matched the things that, you know, they're not, it's not happening in their own environment. It's not using the games or the tools or the things that they do. I, I prefer just to get in there and say, well, let's, what do you like to do? Let's actually do the thing. And, you know, I think the results speak for themselves. So that's all I'll say about that. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> think so too. Yep. Yeah, no, it, you know, here's the thing. There's anytime you sort of work outside the box, I found that you run into, uh, there's a certain, um, uh, people kind of raise their eyebrows at you and, and you know, uh, what is, I don't know about, you know, about that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I've run into that too, even after seeing massive success with, uh, with what I was doing with, with various things and, um, and, and people just sort of still scoffing at it and, and just completely ignoring the success. Um, but because it doesn't fit with their idea of how things should be done. Um, and it's, it's kind of more, more focused on the process than on the, uh, the needs of the person that you're working with. So, yeah. all right. So what one message would you like to give gamers who are not on the autism spectrum? Oh, I mean, that's easy, right? Everybody should be welcome at your table, right? If you, if you, I mean, a lot of people out there, you know, want their games to be more diverse they want their games to reflect you know the what is amazing in the world around them that means you have to include everyone at your table right and i mean some of the, the best stories some of the best moments that that i've had at a table are you know with folks who are not like me right like if uh, i mean your story would be so boring if if everyone was just like you or approached you know obstacles or challenges the same way you did right you you, you want to, to be a better person you need to tell stories and work with people who are not like you mm -hmm. i any i think the first thing i mean in addition to all what daniel said um is just listen you know just get to know somebody and, and ask, you know, how do you like to play the game? What makes you feel comfortable? Safety tools are super helpful, I think, especially if you're, you know, getting into a situation where you're gaming with people that you don't know or that are different, that seem different than you um, in different ways, right? Um, but I mean, any everything that I've learned from Level Up, like the things that we do in Level Up or the tools that we use, they work, you know, I found that I can use them in different settings and they make the game more accessible for everybody. So if you invite someone into your table who is neurodiverse and maybe this is the first time, you know, please listen and recognize that you may be playing it a little bit different and that may feel uncomfortable at first, but ultimately I feel like there's so much to be learned that would benefit um, future players as well. Yeah. Yeah, boy. Um we have a very diverse group uh, that I play with. And uh, I found as a GM uh, that on the one hand, it's, it's challenging, challenging as a GM, not because of, uh, you know, abilities or, or anything like that, uh, but because when you pull a whole bunch of very different people together, you never know what's going to happen. And yeah, uh, it's absolutely true. And, and so, you know, people talk about games that are sandbox versus uh, railroaded. And I say, I have an, I have an off-road campaign. Um, 
It's, you know, I, I lay out a nicely paved road for them and they never stay on it, but yeah. it makes for great stories and everyone has a great time with it. So it's like, well, okay, wow. I never would have imagined that, but well done. That's usually how it works. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. So I love the, to be open to what people are throwing at you. Um, I don't, I, this is, uh, not necessarily a story from Level Up, but a story from another nonprofit I ran a game with. And uh, I'll try to tell it, you know how D&D, &D, you're like 30 sessions deep. How do I even start to explain? But the long and the short of it is I, during a combat round, I asked the barbarian what they'd like to do. And they said, I want to go fishing. <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh, okay. And it turns out the barbarian waded into the a river that was secretly a time traveling river and disappeared into time and the rest of the group had to find them and it made the story really interesting so that's definitely that moment of oh my gosh what am i going to do <laughs> what am i going to do with this but to yes and it and fold it into the story it's, it's such a cool moment when that happens and it makes the story feel alive for sure and so uh any other projects daniel mentioned you mentioned some um any other projects either you're working on right now I have stuff that I can't talk about yet. Of course. <laughs> um, but I, I'm i excited to hopefully run it with our group. Because so I think what I'm designing is going to work really well for Level Up. Mm -hmm. Secrets. <laughs> stay tuned. Um, Follow yeah, Daniel. Yeah, stay tuned. I can't, can't say anything yet. But um, I, I think uh, Level Up Gaming in 2022 is going to see us um, make a big step. I think we're going to try to, you know, get another GM and OT by, by I guess our, our winter slash spring of, of uh, 2022. We'll have a, hopefully have another one. Mm -hmm. All right. Naomi, anything you're working on? Well, in the, in the TRPG space, I'm, like I said, I'm doing research. I've, we're collecting data just for a, believe it or not, there's been no study done on how playing TRPGs affects people's engagement in everyday activity. So it seemed like a great place to start in terms of trying to figure out, you know, we're, we're, I'm lit, you know, I'm practicing OT and D and D and TRPGs, you know, and I, I can see the effects, but, um, you know, explaining or communicating this to a larger audience or just getting to, I don't, we don't sit down and interview participants, right? So just sit, sit down and talk to people about, do they feel like the game has connected them to, uh, or made it easier or more difficult, who knows, to do other activities. Um, so we're working on that right now. As I, I mentioned with the story I just told, I've been, um, you know, kind of trying to spread the word <laughs> among uh, <laughs> other organizations. So I, my first job as an OT is a nonprofit called Balance for Blind Adults in Toronto. And so it, after the, you know, after pa the pandemic, I think I had mentioned, you know, I'd love to run a game of D&D. &D. And then after the pandemic, I finally got to, the pitch finally landed. I was like, you don't even need a computer. You could call in and you can still participate. You know, anybody can play. It's it's something different from trivia. And I'm happy to say, you know, again, like 30 sessions later, that's going very well. Um, yeah, and in terms of level up, like I said, we want to build capacity because there are only two of us. There are only so many evenings in a week and we have other jobs and things going on. So I think that bringing other people on board is going to be a real focus over the next little while in terms of uh, where Level Up goes. All right. So we will have all your contact information in the show notes. Where is the one best place that you'd like people to start to learn more about you or to contact you? Oh, you can just reach out to me on Twitter at Daniel H. Kwan, K-W-A-N. You can find basically everything related to me there. Yeah, I'm a. I'm also into Twitter more than this. Is my number one social media. I think it's Naomi underscore Hazlitt, and uh, I have a website, NaomiHazlitt.com. It will probably direct you to Twitter or the other social media pieces. But I, I'm just adding pieces in my portfolio, um, and it'll be a way for you. You know, I, it, the best way to contact me would be Twitter, but you could probably get a hold of me on there too. So yeah, looking forward to keeping the conversation going. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. And everyone check out those links in the show notes. Thanks for having us. Thank you.
Before we get in the next section, the kind of trigger warning. We're going to be talking about breathing difficulties. So if that's problematic for you, thanks so much for sticking with us and being part of the solution. Hit the like, subscribe, and share buttons, and we'll see you next episode. For everyone else, welcome to Playing the Other. How to play a disabled, mentally ill, or neurodivergent character, whether PC or NPC, that properly represents symptoms so as to represent those real-life people in your game and give them depth as characters while avoiding harmful stereotypes and tropes. Today, to help us with that, we are joined by Nico Meyering. Welcome, Nico. Hi, Dale. Thank you for having me. So what would you like us to know about you as a person and as a gamer? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Nico. I use he, him pronouns. For those of you who might be listening in and have vision impairments or difficulties, I'm a blonde man wearing spectacles, um, and I'm wearing a long sleeve kind of beige shirt uh, against a computer generated background that shows mountains, I think. Uh, I live with a ultra rare breathing disorder called congenital central hypoventilation syndrome or CCHS. Ultimately, I find that our lives are stories that we're constantly telling and we are constantly writing. And the most important thing to remember for disabled people like myself and for people in general is that we have a right to tell our own stories. The collaborative storytelling aspect of Dungeons and Dragons is what draws me to the game. Of course, I love the mechanics, but what keeps me coming back to the table time and time again for years now is each character's individual story how they contribute to the overall campaign and the narrative story there, and how those stories interact with each other. Dungeons and Dragons shares another characteristic with the disability experience, and that is that we're only as strong as our supports. A solo adventurer is not going to get very far. A party of adventurers will get much farther. The disabled activist and writer Alice Wong once wrote in her book, the narrative trajectory of a disabled person's life is necessarily webbed. We are often only as strong as our friends and family make us, only as strong as our community, only as strong as the resources and privileges we have. So I rely upon my medical care team the same way that a Goliath barbarian might rely upon a lizard folk cleric. No, that, that's so important. Uh, you know, I, I've come to understand that the whole concept of is no, who you, no matter what your abilities are or anything like that, we all depend on each other. And that's right. uh, it's just in different ways, depending who you are, depending what your circumstances, your needs, um, all of that. But uh, yeah, you don't have to uh, be uh, disabled for that to be the case. It's, it's true of everyone. That's true, yes. All right. So what would you like people to know about your symptoms, how you experience them, how you adapt to them, and what is and isn't helpful? Sure. Thank you so much for this question. So like I said, congenital central hypoventilation syndrome, or CCHS, is a super rare genetic nervous system disorder where most dramatically, the body's impulse to breathe automatically is majorly suppressed or entirely absent. And this is important because breathing is the most essential life function, more than getting nutrients, more than staying hydrated. We all need to breathe. Our bodies can send signals that our brains don't always receive. With under 2,000 cases worldwide, uh, CCHS is what's called an orphan disease. There is no cure for CCHS. There is very little research being done. Um, there is not a lot of, shall we say, profit incentive for pharmaceutical companies to make a pill or for medical equipment companies to come up with um, more and newer models of life-sustaining equipment. Our only treatment is mechanical ventilation when we're asleep and when we're sick. This is often done through uh, tracheotomies 
and mechanical ventilation, which we usually see in young kids with CCHS, right? Babies fall asleep like at the drop of a hat. There's no uh, set wakefulness or sleeping schedule for the first few years of uh, infancy. So we often find that 24 seven ventilation is the most useful way to live your life. Then as you're able to stay off, uh, stay awake longer and longer, as you develop your own sleep schedule, uh, then we can begin sprinting. And sprinting is called, is what we call being off the vent during wakefulness hours. I myself had a tracheotomy uh, until age six or seven. And then I transitioned to a face mask, which kind of fits around my nose and mouth. Uh, and then I just hook that up at night when I go to sleep. It's a lot like a sleep apnea machine. I recently upgraded my machine uh, to a model that has an internal battery and doesn't just rely upon uh, a power cord. So that was a huge upgrade for me, and it was a long time coming. People with CCHS also tend to have vision issues, so I have glasses, as I mentioned, uh, weight gain issues, so I eat quite a bit, actually, but I've like been stuck at about 150 pounds my entire adult life, and I'm like 5'10", 5'11", so relatively tall and relatively thin, regardless of like how much I intake. I'm also experiencing cardiac issues, so I have uh, cardiac pauses that present themselves. Uh, in my case, this started around college age, 18 to 20. We also see this in young kids with CCHS, um, so I do have a cardiac pacemaker implanted, uh, and now, thankfully, there's good monitoring available, um, and medical guidelines suggest that if we see a cardiac pause of three seconds or longer on a halter monitor test or in a loop recorder, um, medical guidelines then suggest implanting a pacer right away. So it's good that that's addressed. We also have issues with temperature control. So being out in the heat of the summer day is not useful for us. Um, that could be dangerous very quickly. Uh, it's not uncommon for me also to like feel cold physically, but then still be sweating. Uh, so there is some disconnect there. Uh, ultimately, I am my own best advocate. Ultimately, disabled people are their own best advocates. Like I said earlier, we tell our own stories. Um, <clears throat> and people in my life can best support me and I feel that people can best support their disabled friends and family and peers by listening to their needs and listening to their experiences. I love being an advocate for disabled people and especially people with rare disabilities. Being a disabled man is not all of my identity, but it is a core part of my identity. And I've chosen to find a lot of life purpose and passion in uh, volunteering a lot in this area of disability advocacy. Right. So I, I, I resonate with that. I have uh, children with uh, rare disabilities yeah. too. And, yeah. and uh, like I said, there's not, uh, there's not a lot of incentive uh, for research on, on stuff like that. You, you say, Oh, well, we're working, we're working on this on what, <laughs> what is, yeah. That? What, why don't you put your effort on, you know, where it's going to affect more people, you know, so. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's the reality. Yeah, if you listen to teams of doctors or if you go to medical conferences or you spend time on Google Scholar, you start to realize that there's no real aha moment in medical research. Um, every study, every effort just kind of moves the ball a little bit further. And that underscores the need for collaboration, communication, and just to keep going for consistency. All right. So if someone's including a PC or an NPC in their game with symptoms like yours, how would you like the character played and how can the other party members help? Sure. I actually took some time before this interview to like study up on my spell lists. Um, probably the best way to mimic the symptoms of CCHS in D&D gameplay is to consider the uses of the third level spell Feign Death, which is available to uh, clerics, bards, druids, I think wizards too. Uh, the spell text reads, 
you touch a willing creature and put it into a cataleptic state that is indistinguishable from death. For the spell's duration, one hour, uh, or until you use an action to touch the target and dismiss the spell, the target appears dead to all outward inspection and dispels used to, to determine the target's status. The target is blinded and incapacitated and its speed drops to zero. Much like if I'm uh, knocked out uh, by playing contact sports, then I'm you know not breathing, I am not moving, I'm not coherent or cognizant. Uh, going back to the spell text, the target has resistance to all damage except psychic damage. If the target is diseased or poisoned when you cast the spell or becomes diseased or poisoned while under the spell's effect, the disease and poison have no effect until the spell ends. One thing that I'm grappling with, like as a player and as a DM myself, is the knowledge that you know humans sleep what seven to eight hours per night ideally, and that spell duration for pain death is only one hour, so you have to keep expending a third level spell slot to cast it. Um, as a player, I usually play clerics, I love playing clerics. However, a player character. PC or non-player character NPC uh, with CCHS might reasonably be like an artificer. Uh, an artificer uses their class ability to make magical items like uh, like goggles or goggles of night that enhance your vision, enable you to have good dark vision or dark vision at all. And at, artificers also access some wizard spells, which they can use to perhaps mitigate CCHS symptoms. So far in my playing career, I haven't really seen a lot of groups. I haven't played in a lot of groups or run games from any groups that make uh, frequent use of a short rest mechanic. But if we're thinking about it realistically, uh, people with CCHS who become adventurers in this game set would definitely benefit from using short rests um, probably numerous times a day. And honestly, if we were... D&D characters ourselves, like realistically, we might use short rests quite often as well. So I even have a couch pillow that I got off Etsy that says, I need a short rest. And like, when is this not true? When do we not need to roll our own hit dice and stay hydrated, take a quick nap, uh, put our feet up and prioritize physical and mental self-care? Yeah, boy, absolutely. Um, in culture that, uh, glorifies busyness uh yeah it's it's really not healthy so yes that's true i should also point out that you know disability is not a monolithic experience there is not any one culture or experience to disability there are many cultures and many experiences i do find that like making the disability community more welcoming and more empowered through projects like these are a big part of my self-care, even though it does expend my energy and time. Uh, I love feeling accomplished. I love helping to achieve things. Um, I love collaborating with others to make the world a better place. Uh, so self-care is not just um, taking a bath with a bath bomb or eating and drinking enough. It's also getting the vital work done and engaging in your hobbies, even if they sometimes do expend your energy. All right. Um, do you have any online projects or social media profiles that you'd like to share? I do. Uh, I have a PowerPoint slide up here. I'm going to try and share my screen. I don't know how this will work with recording, but um, all I can do is try. Present no. My entire screen. Yes, this one. Share. Okay, we're going to go over here. And we're going to uh, start presenting. You should be seeing a slide that says Nico on the net with an image of uh, me on the left and then some bullet points to the right. Uh, can you see that? Uh, I can see it. I don't know whether it'll show up in the recording or not. Hopefully. Okay. So I'll just uh, talk about what's going on here. On Twitter and Instagram, I am at name starts with N. Um, and on LinkedIn, you can find me under Nicholas Meiring, N-I-C-O-L-A-S-M-E-Y-E-R-I-N-G. 
I began my disability volunteering experience and disability volunteering career, uh, serving as a board member for the CCHS Family Network. I served in that capacity for six years, and you can find us online at cchsnetwork.org. .org. Um, so for them, I helped welcome new families. I helped manage online presence a bit, and I remain active in uh, helping new families find their footing when they have a child with a CCHS diagnosis uh, or when someone with CCHS is trying to find their way in the world, gain employment, live independently, um, just live as normal and healthy a life as possible. Um, since March 2021, I've been more actively involved in the wider disability community. I am honored to have been inducted into the National Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame, and that's run by the National Disability Mentoring Coalition. You can find them at ndmc.pyd.org. Uh, so the National Disability Mentoring Coalition is a nonprofit organization that tries to enhance mentoring uh, experiences and opportunities for and among disabled people. Um, it's incredibly important for successful disabled adults to help the next generation of disabled people. My own personal goal within that realm is to make sure that my achievement ceiling becomes the next generation's achievement floor. I would be massively honored and impressed if the next generation could dwarf my accomplishments. Uh, I'm also part of the Diversability Leadership Collective, uh, and that's at diversability.mn.co. Uh, diversability is kind of a disability rights advocacy United Nations, where uh, disability advocates from all different corners of the world and all different corners of the disabled experience come together to push forward on common causes and common projects. Right now, I'm most interested in, um, and I've stopped sharing my screen, by the way. Right now, I'm most interested in driving up the percentage of disabled people who are engaged in the US workforce. Census data recently came out, and that data tells us that for disabled people who are working age, so age 18 to 64, a wide range, under 20% of those people are actively engaged in the workforce. And that's a very low number. Of course, there are some barriers to this. There's some level of discrimination. Uh, there's less access to educational opportunities and to uh, workforce and skill enhancement capabilities. Um, there's less and fewer vocational opportunities out there for disabled people to gain uh, employability skills. But what I'm trying to do uh, through my efforts is to drive that number up. In November, I'll be leading a workshop uh, for the Diversability Leadership Collective on uh, how to find job and job finding resources how to market yourself through resumes and cover letters and interview processes, and then just generally how to advocate for yourself as a disabled person. We are our own best advocates, and we'll have to advocate for ourselves to our doctors, to our friends, our teachers, uh, eventually to our partners as we grow into adulthood, so that advocacy never stops. Um, and then I think after Labor Day, I'm taking part in a program run by both an organization called Elevate Mentoring and Chronically Capable, uh, which is a six-week program. Uh, once an, one hour every week, I'll be working one-on-one -on -one with other disabled people to um, get a good cover letter going, work on interview skills, uh, write an impressive resume, um, advocate for themselves, just generally being able to put your best foot forward and generally being able to access um, workforce enhancement skills and opportunities will lead to further engagement in the workforce for disabled people. So that's kind of my next push. Wow, that's great. 
And Thank uh, you. longtime viewers of the show will know that I'm a hardcore fan of mentoring in of, of all different kinds. And so um, just really always happy to hear uh, when people talk about that. All right. So as Nico already mentioned, everyone's experience is different. So note that what you heard today doesn't represent everyone with similar symptoms or diagnoses. This is just one example. If you would like to come on the show and help people understand your symptoms so they can have more accurate representation in their games, you can go to wormworkspublishing.com and contact me there. Nico, thank you for sharing yourself with us so that we can bring reality into fantasy and thus make that fantasy world a reality. Thank you for all that you do, and thanks for listening. So just a reminder, if you are not signed up for our newsletter yet, you can go do that right now. No, seriously, right now, go. Why are you still here? Oh, you're already signed up? Cool, that's great. Otherwise, wormworkspublishing.com. Go get our free newsletter. Now, if you see this being helpful, hit the like button. And if you'd like to see more, hit the subscribe button. And if you know people that need to hear this, please pass it on to them. And if you, like me, think that everyone needs to hear this, pass it on to your social media friends. And don't forget those cast ratings. That makes a huge difference to spread the word by increasing our ranking in their algorithms. And so, we close with this question. How have role-playing games helped you socially?